All right. Yeah, the problem with the end of the day, apparently the good stuff is empty. <coughs> but it's all right. Um, hello. Welcome to our talk, Exploiting Bluetooth from your car to the bank account. Um, to get this out of the way, first, the main speaker sadly cannot be here tonight. Uh, he didn't receive a visa in time. We still don't have to do without him. Uh, but the second part of the video with all the technical details um, of the talk will be given via video. So if you have questions at the end, uh, afterwards, I'll do my best to answer them online or offline or connect you with Vlad, um, who's the main wizard behind this talk, really. Um, to prove this, I'll let Vlad introduce himself, and I hope this works. Do we have sound? Do we have any sound? Otherwise I can introduce him, but... up all the way? Yeah, uh, on this it is. On here, I don't know. Can we check the volume on your computer? That is up all the way? It's not <laughs> Recording. My name is Vladislav, but some of you might know me as Wiser and Streets. I'm a big bounty hunter and primarily focus on web mobile and infrastructure when it comes to pen testing. I also focus on code reviews and development of the tools and frameworks. I'm currently open to the new opportunities, so feel free to reach out. I also have additional certifications, awards, and masters. But the most important fact is that I have never attacked booters or cars before, and uh, I applied some of the bounty hunting techniques to it and got some interesting results for you. 
All right. Um, yeah, sorry for this. Apparently, this was the first talk today with audio. So let's move on. Um, after Vlad introduced himself, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Martin. I'm a security researcher and a scientist at the Swiss Cyber Defense Campus, which is the um, procurement agency of the Swiss military. Uh, I have a background in wireless security, been publishing in all the major academic system security conference, and I've been leading research efforts, not just on cars, but uh, on all, of, all sorts of transportation security um, at our campus. Uh, that includes aviation, so I've just done a talk at the Aerospace Village, um, so you can always check that out, but also space, cars and trains. I have never looked at Bluetooth before this work, um, but we've done work on cars, so you can also check out um, brokenwire.fail, where we've hacked uh, electric charging processes. So let me first introduce you to the um, motivation for this research. One of our main jobs at the campus is to support procurement for the Swiss military and for the federal government. So we want to really make sure that the government and the military buy secure systems. As you can imagine, the DOD buys quite a lot of IT systems, but also other systems such as cars. Um, if you buy that in high volume, you have quite decent negotiation leverage with manufacturers. Uh, in general, public procurement, if you don't know, it's done with tenders. You can basically broadly divide it into a pre-tender stage, then the actual tender contract, and the time after actually having procured the systems and even received and deployed the systems. Um, doing simple pen testing after you have bought these things, that's often too late for us. Um, the leverage you have in negotiations, it's partly gone and the systems, they're already in operation. I mean, at that point you run insecure systems. So that's not ideal. Something else we do is uh, we do a lot of research on standards. That works. Uh, if you look at aviation, for example, you find a lot of flaws. And in principle, you can try to change that in the long run. The problem is most of these areas have very long life cycles. So even if you find and demonstrate major flaws and protocols and technologies being used there, it will take decades until that is being changed in practice. So again, not too helpful um, for our case here. So what do we want to concretely do here to, to support our procurement? Um, we want to do concrete vulnerability research as early as possible. Uh, we want to really help shape the security requirements during, during the process and in the final tenders. To do that, we work with the manufacturers, but we also use support from academia in Switzerland and outside um, to bring everyone together to make the systems more secure and not just do this for us, but for everyone. So concretely, if we do research, we follow a responsible disclosure process with the manufacturers. If you find anything, uh, we publish at conferences, also come to hackercons now, uh, and we also release our code wherever possible, just as in this case. That brings me then to today's concrete case study, vehicles and the army and Bluetooth. As uh, alluded earlier, the DoD buys a lot of vehicles, not just these that you can see here, uh, probably the ones you think of first. Um, luckily, these don't have Bluetooth, or at least I think, I mean, I haven't checked all of them, you, you don't really know. They might exist these days as well, but uh, in general, they don't. Um, but honestly, boringly, by far the most vehicles being procured by our DOD are box standard, run-of-the-mill civilian cars. And they all have Bluetooth. You basically cannot buy a car without it, even if you want it. So even we can't get that without. That brings me off the, the scope of this research now. Um, Bluetooth, of course, is not the only interface you find in a car. Cars are super complex systems. When doing a count, uh, we found at least 19 interfaces in modern cars. 
from Wired or WD ports to the key fob. If there's an issue with any of these interfaces with these systems, the only, the only way traditionally for a manufacturer to do anything and to deal with it in that car and that model is to do a recall. And recalls typically for safety problems, they're expensive and rarely done, really just for a very important safety problem. For security reasons, uh, this rarely happens, to be honest. So that leaves us with a very complex attack surface, much of which actually has been discussed uh, at DEF CON, also at the Car Hacking Village. Um, they specialize in that, of course. But uh, just an illustration here, don't have to check all of this, but it's a very big complex surf cars, uh, attack surface you have in modern cars. So why are we looking now specifically at Bluetooth? Well, most importantly, nobody had done it yet. So there's a lot of Bluetooth research, of course, but nobody has really checked uh, on a large scale all the exploits that exist in Bluetooth with a reasonable amount of cars. So that sort of Bluetooth security in cars hasn't been addressed. That felt to us like an oversight, not, not just from the procurement perspective, but over one billion cars have Bluetooth. And as mentioned, you can't do anything about that if you buy a new car. That overall makes the research very impactful, not just for us, but really for anyone with a car. And we're very happy also with the outcomes uh, that we had from this research, which was led by, by Vlad, who will now present the technical details. And uh, I will come back afterwards for any questions or any information. Bluetooth is a short-range wireless communication standard and it is not specific protocol but multiple different protocols that program top for each other and that are maintained by different entities. Due to this complexity, there are different errors and misunderstandings that arise and the, these are the primary source of the vulnerabilities that we keep finding. We are only going to talk about the Bluetooth classic here, we are not going to talk about the Bluetooth energy at all. So what you have to remember about the Bluetooth is that it is a transport plus additional functionality on top of it. And when I refer to the functionality, I refer to the Bluetooth profiles that allow you to make calls, stream audio, share context messages, and even have the whole internet stack on top of the Bluetooth. So Bluetooth is rich in the functionality and we have to secure it and for that we have pairing. When it comes to pairing, it depends on the capabilities of the device and the share and the security options. So when it comes to the capabilities themselves, they depend on the input and output capabilities of the device. So if the device has both of them, then we call such device display yes, no. If the device has only output capabilities, then we call such device display only. When it comes to the devices that only has input capabilities, we call such devices keyboard only devices. And when the device doesn't have any of the capabilities, so we call such devices no input, no output capability device. We can also summarize the security model of the Bluetooth as everything or nothing, as pass pairing. We can access almost all function functionality that is available to us on the target device without any further authorization in most of the cases. That's why we have to be sure and confident in the pairing process, and for that we have different pairing modes. So when the one of the devices doesn't have doesn't support uh, security options, then uh, for example it doesn't have simple security pairing or and secure connections, then uh, legacy parent is used, and from its name you can infer that it's legacy and ideally it shouldn't be used at all. To give you some reasons, it's vulnerable to the non point to attacks and also uh, the <clears throat> The, the link, the, the security of the link depends on the four digit pin, which we can easily brute force. So then when it comes to devices that uh, doesn't have uh, input capabilities, if one of the devices doesn't have input capabilities, then just works pairing mode is used. And uh, if for this pairing mode, there are no guarantees that you are actually pairing with the device that you want to pair with. And uh, that's why it is intrinsically vulnerable to the middle middle attacks. When it comes to the passkey entry, it was recently discovered that uh, it's vulnerable to the message confusion when the middle attack, which is not uh, remediated yet in the latest uh, Bluetooth version, it might be there for a few years at least. 
So it leaves us with only one uh, pairing mode, which is actually secure, and this is a numerical version. And it is executed only for the devices that have display as no capabilities, and uh, they both want to pair with each other. Then, when it comes to when we are past pairing, most of the firmware, well, all of the firmware, do not differentiate between the pairing modes used. So whether or not you use the secure pairing mode or not, and uh, that means that. Uh, legacy pairing is the same as the American person, at least in the eyes of the firmware. So, boosters have been there for more than 23 years, and we have found that there are more than 108 different attacks on the booster standards themselves as of March 2024. Also, Sans provided statistics that there are approximately 650 different CVEs related to the booster devices as of 2022, and even more uh, right now. So for the presentation, we are only going uh, we have we are going to differentiate between four different categories of the exploits. So when when I refer to the critical exploits, I refer to the remote code execution, memory leakage, information leakage. But uh, then, in the middle of the announcers categories are actually self-explanatory, while chaining while chaining uh, category uh, describes. Uh, not specifically vulnerabilities or exploits, but rather weaknesses that uh, one can use uh, to to make the attacks possible, or they actually allow uh, or make some of the attacks to be executed easily. We actually tried, to, uh, even though there are, sorry, even though bridges have been there for. 22 years have been subject to the uh, extensive security research. There are still charges involved uh, into testing it. So, uh, it lacks the common database of religious vulnerabilities, it lacks the framework for testing it. And uh, I, in general, the attacks are being shared, but the proof of concepts are not. And if they are shared, they are generally shared on the uh, sites that are not quite well indexed. So it's quite challenging to find such proof of concept. And if you find the proof of concept, there is also there is a high there is a high chance that the proof of concept will be based on the old hardware that you cannot buy anymore. And this also applies to the recently recently publicized uh, exploits. For example, it's Hardware 23. When it comes to testing, there are intrinsic false positives and false negatives when you test in the black box uh, fashion for the now service based attacks. And then it's a bit tricky to it's a bit tricky to automate uh, the denial service attacks in some cases, especially for some of the devices, because uh, the denial service attacks are quite powerful in these cases, and uh, re it requires rebooting the device. But it's quite difficult to do. For example, um, in case of the cars, in some cases it requires to wait for 10, 20, or 30 minutes. So it's a bit tricky. We tried to solve some of these problems, and that's why we came up and uh, uh, open source the framework for vulnerability testing framework for Blizzard Classic. I collected and redeveloped 44 different exploits. Also, the main goal is uh, representability of the past and future research. There is also a balance between automation, semi-automation, and manual tests. So, uh, even though the attacker side is automated, the uh, victim side is not, it's infeasible to do so, so you still have to do some of the manual actions on the, for example, on the infotainment screen. I also evaluated half of the exploits on the non-vulnerable devices, while uh, for the other half I ensured that the exploits try to some the payload, but as there were no non-vulnerable devices for them, uh, we use them as is. And but still, these exploits found the real vulnerabilities in the cars, so I'm quite confident in them. The talk itself works pretty straightforward. The test executes the command, then the engine loads the predefined um, exploit profile, then checks for the variability and availability of the target device without requiring any interactions from the tester, then executes the exploit. And after that, depending on the exploit type, it either compares, it compares the value or it checks the variability and availability of the target device once again. After that, the toolkit reports back to the testing. So I use this 
took it to attack uh, different cars and the setup was pretty minimalistic when you base laptop or you could have used the virtual machine usb cables the uh, development board and uh, nexus 5 phone for the uh, denial service attacks and uh, internal blue attacks then i spent approximately one to three hours per hour per car as different issues arose and for some of the uh, cars especially the in general combustion cars, you have to have, you have to test them outside as they require the engine to be started to access the infotainment system, and because of that, you have to test them outside. Uh, if you can connect to the infotainment system and observe the logs, please do that as it would help to remediate some of the uh, some of the false positives and false negatives. So uh, all of the cars were provided by the Sub Defense Campus Army Logistics, and some were provided by friends and acquaintances. In total, we had 22 cars. Only uh, four were partially tested. You might think that the sample size is quite small, but it is the biggest out there. Uh, and uh, we tried to focus on different categories of the cars, uh, of the cars. Uh, monetary wise and also focusing on the top manufacturers so that we will be we would have a notion of the state of the art security Bluetooth security in the automotive industry. And finally all of the Bluetooth kit uh, tests are non-invasive so we didn't have any problems with the cars afterwards. I spent approximately 40, 40 hours throughout a few weeks and uh, found 73 different vulnerabilities. Some issues were not reportable because uh, they are inherent issues and uh, that's why I was able to report only 64 vulnerabilities. All of the vulnerabilities that were reported were reported responsibly and many, all manufacturers and vendors had time to fix them. But you already guessed that not all of them did that but we still are releasing as there have been more time. They had a lot of time to do so. So generally the first thing that I wanted to share is that the cars are generally lagging in adoption of the newest Bluetooth standards. So for example, you wanted to buy a 2023 car, you would expect that the hardware used in it would be rather recent. But in fact, uh, what you get is the Bluetooth version from 2014. And the difference is nine years in this case. Um, on average, it's seven years, and mean is also seven years. So, in the time frame of nine years, there have been uh, a lot of research done into the Bluetooth. So, uh, there are more than 10 different attacks on the core specification itself, which also affects your Bluetooth version. And that's why you have to. You're in risk. You're in risk because there are existing vulnerabilities that could be um, could be exploited in your car. First, you might think that you can remediate them with the firmware update. Here's the first problem: um, most of the cars still don't provide the, the firmware updates. And the second problem is that you cannot remediate the um, core specification attacks with the firmware updates as they generally require the fix in the standard first. The standard level first, then uh, a few years would pass as the new hardware will be developed and be available on the market. After that, you will be able to actually swap the hardware in your car for the newest, but no one is going to do that for you and manufacturers most likely won't be doing that. And this is required because you can change the Bluetooth version only by swapping the hardware. Not You cannot do that in the firmware. So we've been testing for the known vulnerabilities and uh, we actually expected that uh, we won't find uh, uh, known vulnerabilities in the cars produced in 2022 and 2023. That, that were our expectations, but in fact, we still we still found a lot of cars that had them. And for example, Tesla cars, they had a specific man in the middle uh, vulnerability that also should in theory exist in other models. You can check it for yourself. But the most interesting view is actually on the average number of vulnerabilities found per car and manufacturer. As uh, you can you can see here the differences between between them and also the similarities. So when it comes to the critical vulnerabilities, there were only three manufacturers that had them: uh, Renault and Volkswagen. So these vulnerabilities were rather old and they could have been fixed with the firmware update, but there were no firmware updates for these vulnerabilities for these cars. Then the, when it comes to the denial source and manual attacks, uh, you have to notice that uh, 
one if one of the manufacturer doesn't have many middle attacks they would generally have the null service attacks or or vice versa so these types are omnipresent and they can be swapped so, uh, they bo both of them can be used to establish the many middle position so you can use both null service uh, attacks and many middle attacks to aid you in establishing the many middle position so this knowledge would be very helpful in the future so try to remember it and as we've been testing for known vulnerabilities, you already guessed that we found some new ones, uh, especially some new attacks, actually. So the first attack is the contact extractor attack. Here, the victim establishes the, establishes the Bluetooth connection with the car, then shares the contacts via phone book exit profile, and leaves the car without impairing the phone, for example, with, by <clears throat> for example, by switching off the Bluetooth or just walking away. Then we'll be able to uh, spoof the MAC address to the MAC address of the victim, establish the Bluetooth connection and extract the contacts. But it would have been an ideal case, but unfortunately we cannot do that because both the attacker and the car execute run the phone book exit profile client, uh, client service and only the server service can uh, serve the context. So this specific attack applies in the car sharing context and due to that fact uh, we would have to get into the car. We do not need to start the car, we just need to access the infotainment system and it is accessible without the starting the engine. So we would be able to, we would have to search for the parcel number on the infotainment screen then and if the car is vulnerable it would show us the context. So here you can see that we connected to the Renault car. We do not have any context on the left, but when we switch to the dial pad and search for the part of the number, then the context are shown to us. The second attack is very similar to the known put in the middle attack with uh, some caveats that, uh, that, applies, that, apply, that are applied to automotive industry. So some of the cars actually deny connections or pairing to be to be initiated from the node with node boot capability devices but there are also the cars that uh, allow the connection to be initiated from the user smartphone and also from the car so in case the connection is being initiated from the car there are some cars that actually forget that they denied access to the non put non put capability devices and thus it might be possible to get the connections from the car to the uh, attacker for example by self jamming or pre-committing or using other uh, other techniques so that we might be able to get the man in middle position so the third attack is actually the attack on the numeric comparison man in the middle this is an insecure numeric comparison man in the middle attack in this case uh, the it is invitation specific attack so um, in this case the car is either uh, either has the design problem or they have a state problem in case of the state we'd have to uh, check the connection with different uh, capabilities while for the design would have to just observe the pairing process. So in case the car is vulnerable it wouldn't need any confirmation of the pairing on the infotainment screen or it show non put non put like confirmation without showing the pairing number or it will show you a static number across different uh, pairing attempts. So due to this fact, we would have all of the pieces to establish the man in the middle position or just the connection to the car. So to give you some of the examples, examples in case of the Hyundai cars, they show you the pairing number, they show you the button to cancel the connection, the pairing or the connection, and uh, but they, they show you the button to accept the pairing. And this is a problem because the whole logic is in, on the attacker side. In case of the Audi cars, they show you no input, no input like confirmation window, they don't show you the pairing number. And if you click as up, the pairing would be done. After that, they will show you the window with the pairing number and the button to cancel pairing, so unpair. But in this case, there are two, two possibilities. So in the case of the first one, the if the user clicks yes or pair on their phone yes, then um, on their phone first, then uh, we'll be able to, we might be able to get the man in the middle position. If they don't, then uh, they might spot the attack and then, and thus would have uh, five to 10 seconds to execute it. When it comes to the BMW cars, they had uh, a state problem. Some of them still might have, 
uh, but it should be faced in the newer versions, in the new firmware versions. So in this case, you can force the um, you can force the state problem by using uh, the capabilities other than display as no, and it will show you the specific uh, number that you can, you see in the screen. Uh, after that, you'll be able to establish the menu window position or just the connection to the user or to the car. In case of the Renault cars, they didn't give you give the user any control whatsoever, so anyone could connect to it. So you have seen that I have found many different vulnerabilities in the car, specifically uh, primarily denial of service attacks and uh, many middle attacks, but you still might have a question, what can we do with them? And uh, this is what we are going to explore now. So first thing, we can we have to establish the menu middle position, and for that we have three different options. First one is to do selective jamming. In the case of the selective jamming, it's relatively difficult to do, but it's still possible. So in this case, we would have to, sp to spoof the MAC address of the car and then selectively jam it. After that, we might be able to get the uh, connection request or parent request from the user or do it vice versa. The second option is to use denial of service attacks and deny uh, Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth service to the car and then spoof the MAC address uh, again and um, get the connection from the user or vice versa. The third option is actually to pre-commit with different MAC addresses but the same names as both the car and the user would expect. So in this case, if we connect to the car, we would have the uh, name of a user and if we connect to the user, we have, would have the name of the car so that uh, the user would be lured into pairing. You might actually have a question or a problem with discovering the um, MAC addresses, you might think it is difficult, but in fact it's rather easy and became easy as of recently. So for example, you have at least two options. The first option is to simply listen for the uh, for the MAC addresses, for discoverable MAC addresses with your uh, laptop hardware. You would be able to find only discoverable MAC addresses, so the sample size uh, won't be big, but it might be enough for the attacks. And the second option is to use Blue Squeeze attack to actually get the MAC addresses, almost all MAC addresses are in the Blue Classic space with the help of EuroSRP and Ubitus. So it's approximately 2,000 dollars worth of the equipment. Uh, so with that, you'll be able to discover the MAC addresses that are in non-discoverable mo mode for almost all of the attacks that we are going to show you. So then, with this specific Parts, you would be able to get your first click or the first seamless click and uh, after that you might have a question uh, what can we do with the menu window position so in this case we would have to escape the Bluetooth sandbox because we are in so to say Bluetooth sandbox as we cannot uh, execute the code we cannot execute arbitrary code on this other device and because of that we would have to switch to the phones rather than and look for the functionality that we can exploit. So in this case, generally phones have the phone functionality. They allow you to make calls, so play uh, music or stream audio without any authorization. While when it comes to sharing the context and messages, they require the authorization in some cases. Then they also allow you to uh, emulate the SIM card of the victim or user and get access to the SMS messages and phone calls. While this might seem uh, very interesting, the specific semi access profile this is actually deprecated and it's only available on the Android devices and has a lot of warnings. It's not like uh, users, users would not dismiss the warnings, but still uh, it's only available on the Android device. And in fact, the most interesting one is the message access profile which allows you to extract different messages, for example, SMS messages and emails. In case of the emails, it's only available according to the specification. I haven't, I haven't been able to find any implementation that actually worked with the emails. So you might, you might find that, might not. I'm not sure in case of the emails, but what I know for the fact is that you can extract the SMS messages that were ever delivered to the phone, and also you can send the SMS messages. So additionally, the user experience is very helpful as on the iOS devices, this specific functionality is called notifications, while on the Android devices, it's called messages. So there is no mention mentioning of SMS messages at all. 
So we come to the generic attack that you can execute. And the first thing that you need is the man in the middle position, which requires uh, which required one click from the user, and then you would be able to ask for the messenger exit profile uh, access, which would require another click from the user. Once granted, you would be able to instruct the user's phone to send the SMS message or call a specific number that you control, so that you would be able to link the phone number to yourself and then use it in the open source intelligence flow, automatic flow, so that you will be able to discover the login names or email addresses, or just use the phone number directly on the services of interest, and then uh, trigger the SMS-based OTP for the accounts that are associated with the victim's phone number. And then the OTP would be delivered to the victim's phone, which we can always retrieve as we have the master X profile access and then relay back to the backend and hijack the account. If this sounds all quite complicated and unlikely to you, I actually have some good news. So first, we do not need to have the manual no position at all, we just need the connection to the phone. Secondly, we can link the phone numbers uh, by accessing the metadata of the SMS messages that were previously delivered. And I guess almost all of us have some SMS messages that were delivered to the uh, phone numbers that we use. Then we can also look for the content into the contents of the SMS messages and look for the emails and the login names. Or alternatively, we could use the phone number in the or the data that we found in the open source intelligence flow. Then finally, we do not need to have the we do not need to ask for the master X profile authorization for some of the phones, especially 2022 and older phones. But also, this applies to the latest phones as well. So this is a one to two click generic account takeover attack. With this attack, we can bypass MFA. We can um, we can hijack accounts for the service that primarily rely on the service based OTPs, for example, meta services. And but the most interesting services that we want to hijack or potential perpetrators would want to hijack are the ones that for which we can trigger the SMS based OTP by knowing some information. In most of the cases, it's e knowing the email address or the login name. So by knowing this information, you would be able to trigger the SMS based OTP and to know this, get to know this information, you can use the open source intelligence form. Then you would be able to hijack PayPal, Coinbase, Google account in case the user is not logged in into the uh, Google account on the Android phone. Then you would be also able to, for example, hijack the apps to control the vehicles. But for some of these services, it's rather difficult to do. So in the case of the Apple ID, you have to resort to phishing only as the victim is constantly notified and uh, it's invisible to you, uh, the recovery in the timely fashion. Then when it comes to the Google account, if the user is logged in um, on an Android device, then we would have to know the uh, browser type and operating system type, uh, type so that we can forge it and as we'll be close to the victim and have similar IP and location, we will be able to bypass all the checks done by Google and hijack the account. To give you some examples, um, we would first start with the Android phone. In this case, this is a Samsung S23 for which I did the attack. So almost all of the Android phones are actually always pairable and discoverable. Um, so you can execute the attack at any time you want. And once we try to connect and pair, the, we can force the notepad notepad uh, confirmation window that wouldn't show any pairing numbers to compare, and thus the user would be um, would see only that a specific device wants to pair with them and uh, the buttons to pair or cancel. So in this case, it's uh, the art of choosing the names to lure the victim into pairing or. Um, for that, we can use uh, we can do the targeted attacks to observe the victim, or just use the most common ones and uh, try to pair randomly. After that, we can ask for the master exit profile uh, access, and in most of the cases, it is a typical workflow for the cars and smart smartwatches and speakers. So, if you forge the name for these devices, you would be more likely to get the uh, messages access if the victim is more or less cautious. But uh, I guess most of the users are not, so they would probably grant the 
uh, access. Once granted, you'll be able to execute the attack, so get the phone number, force the SMS-based OTP on this specific site, then extract the OTP, enter the OTP, change the password, and log out the user from all of the sessions uh, for the Samsung account. And I was able to log out the user from their own phone and completely hijack the Samsung account. So uh, this is a two-click generic attack, and also who is working on the patch for hardening for the Android devices, while Samsung patched this, uh, their part in the Samsung account uh, service in June 24. Uh, they actually said that they fixed the vulnerability in November 2023, but I reported in May 2024 and it was exportable at that time, but who knows. When it comes to exploiting iOS devices, you can actually exploit uh, map the same way on the iOS devices as uh, on the Android devices, as on each new pairing request or in each new repairing pairing, uh, the user would need to explicitly allow notifications by going to the uh, settings menu for this specific uh, Bluetooth device and then toggling the button to allow the notifications. It's quite infeasible when we do the attack that way. But what if we can renegotiate the connection for an already connected device that already has the notification permissions? You would expect that the notifications would be reset on each pairing, which is a requirement uh, as per specification, but uh, iOS doesn't follow that. So you can spoof the MAC address for an already connected device that already has access or permissions and try to repair. In this case, uh, it's here I wasn't able to force the notebook notebook by confirmation window that wouldn't show the pairing number to compare, but you might also experiment with that and maybe get the notebook notebook by confirmation window. But uh, it's, it is unfortunately that uh, it's not the case as of today. But what's most interesting is that the iOS is also, help, also helping us in one other way, they fetch the name of the previously connected device from the cache and use it in the pairing request. So if the user had uh, some kind of esoteric name for their device, they would be more inclined into pairing with us. And once they click pair, we would have the no notification permissions as the previous device, uh, as the previous connection had them. So we'd be able to execute the attack. And in this case, for example, hijack the Facebook. But you might actually want to focus not just on the Facebook, but also on the Apple ID itself. So um, recently there was an attack uh, that involved phishing and uh, same swap attack, and the perpetrators were able to steal twenty-two thousand dollars from the victim. And here we can try to replicate the similar attack with the map uh, map attack. So. Here we'll be able to inject the SMS message as if they came from Apple and do phishing once the user enters the Apple ID and the password, the SMS-based uh, OTP or MFA would be um, would be used and we'll be able to steal, them, uh, steal the SMS uh, message value for or OTP value uh, via the message extra profile attack. So here we just swap the SIM to op with the message extra profile attack. We, we can also focus on other applications like PayPal or Coinbase or any other of interest. So you do not have to always focus on the Apple ID. But <clears throat> the most actually interesting, worrying or best part, or worst part of this talk is that this specific vulnerability is not fixed as of the latest iOS version and it's not going to be fixed. The uh, Apple said that the users are safe uh, because they are showing the parent prompt, but I simply see that uh, they generally violated the business verification and that's why their users are one click away from their accounts being stolen. But of course, it's up to you to judge and decide whether this is a specific vulnerability that should be fixed or not. But I personally hope that Apple would eventually fix it and accredit it accordingly.
For the attack itself, uh, I'm releasing a tool that affects more than 50% of the smartphone market worldwide, more likely to affect the whole market. And this specific tool would allow you to retrieve and send SMS messages, as well as look for the emails and phone numbers on the device. And it would be possible to connect uh, the tool to the infrastructure that would actually do the recovery process. So here we come to the key tag arrays. And the first thing that I want to mention is that even the newer scars are generally shipped with the protocol open source vulnerabilities, and it's not really easy to fix this because the design of the car is locked in uh, just several years before it's manufactured, manufactured, and it's not possible to change the Bluetooth version it or hardware in it. So it's quite difficult to do so. And we have to leave with the anticipation of some kind of uh, protocol or Bluetooth vulnerabilities in the cars and knowing that. Then when it comes to pairing, pairing security uh, or in the security environment is extremely important as it's the only safeguard against the man in middle attacks. But what you have to remember is that forcing repairing is possible and it might be malicious. So we have to watch out for that as well. Then, when it comes to the uh, SMS-based LTP services, or the services that uh, rely only on SMS-based LTPs, it might be rather risky for the end users, and that's why maybe it would be best to consider other uh, OTPs, uh, <coughs> OTP sources. So, for example, uh, email-based OTPs, and in that case, it might add additional safeguards to the users. So, thanks for listening. Now I hand over to Martin and maybe see you next year. All right. Uh, thanks for staying with us. Uh, there's just two points left for me um, at the very end. Let me find the right slides. No, that's not it. Be quicker that way. So yeah, uh, sorry. We've seen that much of Bluetooth is fundamentally insecure, both the standards and the implementations. The toolkit uh, have the link on the last slide as well. Um, is online for you to check your cars, your Bluetooth uh, products, any of them. Um, and of course, we're not liable for anything you do with it. Um, but we focus on Bluetooth and cars, and just the very last thing, of course, you can check anything, and we took it to one of the domains we're very familiar with, which is aviation. We tried it out on our own lab of certified real aircraft hardware, which also has Bluetooth to connect so-called electronic flight bags, which is just an iPad, really, with flight computers. And the thing is, these Bluetooth versions are so old, most of these exploits don't work there, because uh, honestly, you can establish the man in the middle uh, position anyway, because the encryption is just so weak or trivial. So we haven't explored this further, uh, but it should be very easy to uh, also do this on at least these specific um, flight management systems. With that, thank you for listening and also putting up with the video talk. I hope Lud can make it in person next time. This is the uh, QR code to the GitHub repository where you can find all the information, also this disclosure results. Uh, any questions, I'm available and uh, Vlad is also very happy if you contact him online. Thank you very much. <laughs>